your time with us today. Quick uh, rundown on our agenda. Um, we're gonna provide a brief overview of cloud misconfiguration risk, because I think when you're talking about cloud security, you are talking about the configuration of your cloud resources and uh, preventing misconfiguration. Um, and then Wayne is going to simulate a data theft by hacking a database backup on AWS. Um, we will come back with a number of takeaways and recommendations on how to prevent this and general misconfiguration risk. And we'll get to your uh, questions at the end. So what is cloud misconfiguration and why is it a major risk? You know, getting the settings wrong on your cloud services is really what we're talking about. Uh, sounds simple, but it's actually quite complex. It can be really easy to make mistakes when configuring cloud services. Uh, the cloud is, is feature rich. There's a ton of options and a number of ways that, uh, that we can kind of shoot ourselves in the foot when configuring these. And it can get especially difficult considering the amount of change. Uh, that we see that happens in cloud environments quite different than, uh, than the days in the data center. Um, and, and these mistakes generally or all too often go unnoticed um, and, and unfortunately don't wind up getting flagged by compliance regimes, at least uh, some, of the, some of the kind of misconfiguration vulnerabilities we're seeing in the news lately. And why is that? Really, I think it comes down to just humans are just not very good at keeping track of thousands of resources, thousands of anything, really. Um, and, and the millions of potential resource configurations and combinations of those configurations that are possible in the cloud. It's just not, not something that humans are really capable of doing and, you know, not something that you can kind of prevent by throwing an army of people at the problem. If you don't prevent these misconfigurations, it, the results can really be devastating. You know, many cloud native attacks don't traverse traditional networks. Their actions may show up in logs, but often those, those log events look like normal business, normal traffic. It can be really hard to kind of discern problems within all of that noise. Uh, detecting intrusions in the cloud uh, is really difficult, uh, and it's almost always too late. You know, the best you can hope for with kind of the traditional security analysis tools is, is to find out that you've already been hacked. Uh, you know, bolting cloud security on after the fact is just kind of like nailing a board to water. Uh, we typically see organizations just don't find out that they've been breached in the cloud until after their data shows up on the black market a few months later, or, you know, perhaps a hacker brags a bit too much on social media. Uh, this 93% number over here is from a, a survey we conducted of more than 300 uh, uh, professionals that are using cloud at scale. Um, and 93% of them are concerned for a major, major security breach due to misconfiguration. You know, we, we think this should be 100% for anybody operating at scale in the cloud, but um, you know, with any survey, it's pretty hard to get anything higher than something like 93%. So we're pretty happy with that. We, we you know, the concern is out there. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Neil McDonald from Gartner, nearly all successful attacks on cloud services are the result of cu customer misconfiguration, human error. Um, we see this time and time again. Uh, digging into the survey results, uh, this is another thing that surprised us a little bit considering you know most uh most breaches when they hit the news focus on things like you know um, s3 buckets and and while that can be true um, there's a little bit of a myth there in the assumption that these hacks occur just because somebody inadvertently left an s3 bucket um, open to the public that does happen but more often than not it, it you know at least the trend that we're seeing is that those buckets may have been configured securely, but attackers used some more advanced methods by exploiting IAM misconfigurations to move laterally and access uh, data in, in secure, otherwise secure databases or, or, or buckets. 
And I am is, is kind of a tricky one. We'll see that a little bit today with uh, Wayne's simulation. Uh, it's, it's more than uh, identity and access management. In the cloud, I am acts sort of like an alternate kind of cloud native network. Uh, it, it, it provides a path to uh, cloud resources and between cloud resources and getting your IAM configurations uh, done securely is absolutely critical to protecting data in the cloud. This is pretty interesting too, what we've seen with the advent of cloud is, is hacker strategy has actually changed. You know, before cloud, you'd see um, uh, bad actors that target a specific organization and then work persistently to identify vulnerabilities and exploit those within the, in the that might include you know a whole variety of different attack vectors until they find what they need and in the cloud this has kind of been you know the script has been flipped uh, bad actors now use automated tools to essentially scan the public internet um, any any public facing ip address or dns record can be identified misconfigurations can be identified and essentially what happens is they 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 gather up a whole number of different misconfigured configured resources that they find and then they can kind of go shopping find out who owns those which of those targets um look look like uh, ones worthy of of exploiting and then they'll get to work so having a misconfigured resource in your environment can be like putting a target on your organization's back and and making your uh, your data vulnerable So what that also means, I think, is our, our security strategy must evolve with cloud. You know, before cloud, uh, the app team might request some infrastructure from the, uh, the infrastructure team or network or security team who, you know, a couple weeks later, um, if, on a, on a, on a, in a good month, um, they'll get their, their servers and their network to, to do their work. And that would typically be, um, you know, fairly secure. And we'd use network analysis tools, threat detection tools, et cetera, to identify intrusions in progress and, and respond to those. Uh, in the cloud, that doesn't work. Um, and we need to empower our developers who are creating their own infrastructure. We need to empower them to do that securely and keep it secure um, and do that with policy as code validation tools to prevent misconfiguration from happening in the first place and detect misconfiguration and remediate it when they discover it. Um, and, and the point here is really detecting the vulnerability risk rather than detecting the attack in progress. Because once an attack is in progress, your chance of, prevent, of noticing it and preventing it is, uh, is pretty slim. Uh, you know, cloud, the cloud is, is software. So cloud security, all about the configuration and the programmatic configuration of that software. It's really a software engineering problem, not a security analysis problem. Uh, really, your goal is to maintain authorized visibility, discovery, and access to your cloud environment and deny that to unauthorized actors. So with that, I will turn it over to Wayne, who's going to dive into our simulation today. Let me go ahead and stop my share. Hey Drew, uh, thank you. Thank you for the uh, for the intro and the walkthrough. Let me get my let me get my screen shared here. So you should be seeing uh, the slides, the same slides. Is that is that right, Drew? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, I'm going to back up one slide to here because what uh, what I think is really important is that while hacker strategy has evolved um, and, our, and our security must evolve, so therefore have the attacks um, on cloud has evolved. So the attacks that were just not possible, you know, 20 years ago are now just a series of API calls away. And we're talking about network teams, security teams, delivered infrastructure to app developers and app teams. Now entire swaths of, of infrastructure can be delivered and uh, just a short amount of time, just with a few API calls, and and that's really what we're gonna what we're gonna talk about today. Um, so uh, thanks everybody for joining, and um, hopefully this is uh, fun and uh, and informative. 
So to illustrate the attack, I'm going to jump over to to this to this look here. Uh, sorry, one second. Okay, I'm going to jump over this to this view here. Um, I'm going to stay away from the slides uh, pretty much the rest of the time. Um, and what you're looking at here is is feud. This is our product, but please don't worry. This is not a feud pitch. Um, what I'm going to do is is show you how this environment was built over time in a, in a visual way rather than just describing it and clicking through the AWS console. This will show us everything we need to see. So what you're looking at here is one of the earliest uh, scans of the environment that we're using here. It's from, as you can see, a few days ago. Um, and you can tell, of course, I have a few VPCs and two RDS clusters. The situation that we're talking about is I'm a, a large financial institution um, or just any institution dealing with customer data I'm in the process of migrating from an old cluster, an old database cluster, to a new one. And what you see here, um, I'm sorry, and this is following a, a security audit. So things that are in red are kind of the, the flag that, that say, hey, I need attention. So to explore some of these issues um, that you can see with our old database cluster, you'll see things like my database isn't encrypted. Um, I don't have, I'm not, multi, I'm not highly available. Uh, you can see things like I'm missing logging here on my VPC, you know, things like things like that. Um, another piece of information that you can see here, but it's not really highlighted in red, is the fact if I highlight these subnets, these public subnets, and I apologize if I'm going a little quickly, um, I'm, I might be kind of blowing through this a little too quick, but um, public subnets versus private subnets just mean that it's possible to get to it from the internet. And as you can see, groups subnets A and D are tied to this instance. Um, and what that means is that, that it has the potential to be routable from the internet. And that's not good for a, for a database, especially one with sensitive customer data. Um, so that's one of the issues we're gonna fix. So as I kind of pull back a little bit, even though you'll, you'll also notice that even though the point of this is migration, I also have some issues with another VPC that I can kind of fix you know, while I'm under the hood, so to speak. Um, so let's see. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start stepping through and, and show how we've kind of made things a bit more secure over time. I'm just going to go to a few hours later after we've done a little bit of work. And you can already see that the, uh, the red stuff is, is, is going away, is, is basically gone. I fixed an issue here. I fixed the issues here. Um, I now have multiple, highly, I'm highly available. Um, my encryption is turned on, um, all that kind of stuff. And if I leave this hovered, you can see I'm now in, uh, subnets A and B, which are private. So um, to, to, in order to connect to this database, I've now introduced a further barrier, a, a further uh, layer of the onion, so to speak, that I have to get access to uh, a, public, a public route or some way to get to this database, which, is, uh, which by virtue of just uh, using AWS networking is only accessible through um, these public subnets, which has nothing in it, um, and a handful of security groups. So uh, just as a side note, um, you, we, sh we should consider this top VPC in the database here as being production. You would not be doing this, the, this exercise that I'm doing here in a production environment. You would, you would test things out, you would do build outs um, to ensure your process is right in a development environment. And then when you're ready to do the migration for real, then you would see this start to take shape. So at this point, it seems like we're, we're ready. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump in and, and start, doing, start doing my maintenance. So I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit. Um, to where my maintenance is sort of in progress here. Um, and so what you'll see is, uh, first thing you'll notice, I've got a few clusters here. You can kind of ignore that. I was doing a couple other things at the same time and um, the, there, was a, there was a scan taken then. So just kind of pretend this is one. Um, I'm, I'm doing all my work from an EC2 instance that I've spun up inside of this, inside of this VPC so I can connect to it make any kind of schema changes, whatever I need to do, um, create snapshots and start to spin up my, my good infrastructure, which mirrors what I've already created, uh, as I said earlier, would be in a, in a development environment. Um, so things are going well, I've, I'm running my new database, I might be running my old one in a cold standby or even a hot standby so I can fail over quickly if there's a problem. Um, but let's just assume that all of that went great and there are no issues. So now I'm gonna fast forward to you know, essentially to what after maintenance looks like. And let's say we've done this maintenance early in the morning. So my database is gone, this cluster's gone. Um, this one's still here, which is good. 
That's our, this is our new production. Um, but let's say, like I said, we've done this early in the morning. Uh, we missed some steps towards the end because everybody was too busy giving high fives that we left some infrastructure laying around. We've left, it, we've left this EC2 instance. And, and if, you've, if you've been on these series of webinars, you'll know that in previous webinars, we, we've talked about the dangers of working the infrastructure, um, overly permissive I am, um, leaving things exposed uh, to, to open to the internet. Um, we're not going to recreate that here. We're just going to kind of assume that for now. Um, and, the, and the purpose being, um, this is what, what I'm starting to recreate here is um, the attack that happened, uh, a high visibility attack that happened recently that fit almost, fit this profile almost exactly. There was old infrastructure that was left, whether it be during a maintenance or whatever, that had sensitive information on it. And the attacker used that to get to um, a database snapshot. So let's say we leave this as is. This runs for six months, a year. Things are going great. The app is doing well. The company's doing well. We've forgotten about this EC2 instance and this old networking that we don't even need, but it's still just, it's still just out there. Um, but it still doesn't look that bad because our database is doing well. We've got no connectivity from this EC2 instance to this VPC at all, nothing to this database. Um, we have nothing in these public subnets here, nothing else applied to these security groups, just, just the database itself. So our overall posture looks pretty good. We, we've moved from an old, um, not highly available, unsecured, I'm sorry, um, unencrypted uh, database to one that has a much better security posture. So, so we're, we're feeling good. Um, unfortunately, what I'm about to show you is that none of that really matters, right? I've, I've been doing the right things. I've been focusing on securing my live database um, that, that none of that really matters. Uh, so for the, for the hack that we're gonna be simulating or that I'm gonna be simulating, um, I'm gonna go over to the terminal. And so now I'm in, um, now I'm in attacker mode, okay? And so that EC2 instance, um, like, a, like we've talked about, like, like Drew mentioned and Josh has mentioned on previous webinars, um, orphaned infrastructure is scanned and found within minutes. Um, and then it can be continuously scanned <clears throat> as long as it's exposed to the, to the public internet. So now we're, we're in this EC2 instance that's been orphaned, um, that's just been out there. And so now in this view, oops, I'm, now, I'm now sitting here. I don't know exactly where I am as the attacker, but now I can start to do some investigation and try to figure out you know, where I am, what's important, um, what can I do, what do I have permissions to do? All of that stuff I would bring a ton of scripts along with me and, and start to figure things out. Um, I would have already figured out that there are some database, there is a database out there, um, but I may not have any connectivity to it. Um, but that's not really necessarily important. Uh, so what I need to do first is kind of figure out where I am. And, and if you've been on some of our previous webinars, um, you'll, you might have an idea of what I'm about to do. So I'm going to use things like the instance metadata service to figure out what network I'm in. Um, and then I can use that to figure out things like what's the layout of this of this uh, of this network, you know, what security groups are here? What can I what can I use to my advantage? I forgot to do this. One second. Apologize for that. So, figure out what security groups I have. What I'm what am I working with here? Um, I would do the same thing with uh, RDS. I would start to figure out, hey, what 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 are we looking at in terms of snapshots? In this case, what I'm going to be looking for is uh, d database subnet groups. And what I'm starting to do is figure out where can I ideally place a whole new uh, uh, database cluster that has nothing to do with the one that's running that is highly secure. As an attacker, and as we talked about, attacks have changed over time. I would never dream that 20 years ago I could come into a data floor and get a whole new database cluster handed to me. But with, um, with cloud, it's now possible. So given the information that I just put up there, uh, one thing I forgot to do was see what's on disk. Oops. Ah, there we go. Um, so give, like I said earlier, we've got, <clears throat> we've had a, a couple of high level attacks where there have been um, important information just left lying around. One specifically was where some API keys were left on an AWS um, EC2 instance. And those API keys were used to reconstitute a database from a snapshot. And that's, that's exactly what we're about to do. So if I look at what are these database creds, if I look at 
what is this snapshot? These are, these are important, sensitive, critical pieces of information that were just left um, lying around and that I can exploit as an attacker. So using all the information that I've just gleaned by figuring out where I am on the network, what are my security groups, what's around me, um, you know, what, what can I get access to? I can now construct two API calls that look like this, where I can restore a database cluster from a snapshot, this snapshot that you just saw, uh, give it some identifiers. I can figure out what uh, engine I can assume based on what's currently running. I know we didn't look at it in the terminal, um, but I can figure out based on a series of API calls what, what is actually running. I can stand that up and then assuming I have the right permissions, which we talked about, we're just kind of glossing over um, at the moment because we've talked about this before, uh, I can stand up a new database instance. So let's go and let's go and start doing that. Okay, so this response tells me a number of things. Um, one, it tells me that I do in fact have permissions to launch a new database cluster, uh, which is uh, you know, not something that we want an attacker to be able to do. Um, it tells me where, what my uh, connection endpoint is, how I'm going to connect to the database, and it tells me what port I need, to, I need to connect to it. So given that, plus the credentials I've already found on disk, tell me everything that I need to know. So if I go ahead and spin up the instance that's going to sit behind that cluster, I see I can get a lot of the same information or some of the same information anyway. So that takes a little bit of time to spin up. Um, we're, we're doing this like a cooking show. Um, I've, sh I've just put everything in the oven. Now I'm going to show you what the, the finished product um, looks like. Because I've already got one running and I need to go to this one, this view. So now what I've done as an attacker is I'm sitting on the CC2 instance. I've created an entirely new database cluster that looks a lot like the old one, um, but it is an entirely new one. And it, you know, I don't care as an attacker that there are problems with it because that's what I want. Um, but the important thing to note is this database is still untouched. If I were, a, 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 if I were, if I were trying to be destructive, I would see if I could delete this database, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to see what I can get and then get out. Um, this, so this is now running. It looks like I'm golden based on all of those successful API calls, the fact that this is showing up. Um, and so now we're, we're basically off to the races. Uh, let's go back to attacker mode. And let's start connecting to this database. Gonna move this out of the way. To connect to the database, I'm going to use a tool that um, I found left on this instance that was used by the original developers called MyCLI. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's just a, a CLI tool for connecting to MySQL databases. That's long and short of it. Um, here are the credentials that I found on disk. Here is the endpoint ID or the endpoint string that I found after I created the cluster. And then here's the port. So let's see what we can see. So it looks like I'm connected. I don't really know my way around, but just with a series of uh, simple, simple commands, I can just see what the lay of the land is here. Show databases to find out that uh, as an RDS user, I know that a few of these are pretty standard, but there's one in particular that is not standard. So let's go and check that out. Okay, so I'm now connected to the hacking snapshots DB as root. So the tables are here. I see one table uh, called CC apps, CC. I wonder if that stands for credit card and apps might be applications. So let's select everything. Let's see what's in there. Oh, and I've got a table full. This, I say full is 30 or so, um, but imagine this as being, you know, 10,000 or, or 100,000 entries of social security numbers, full names, gender, street addresses, phone numbers, email, the IP address they filled out their application, what their income is, and maybe as, as a financial institution, I have a service that captures their credit score uh, at the same time. So I now have an awful lot of data on, on the people uh, that have applied here. So what I'm gonna do, um, this is really of no use for me just sitting on a database, so I'm going to steal it. I'm gonna switch my output type to CSV uh, using the, this command, and then I'm going to instruct MySQL 
to write my next command out to disk to this location. So I'm just going to run my select statement again. And I now have a CSV dump on disk. So let me just hop out. And I now have dump.csv. Okay, there's all this data. Um, now as an attacker, um, and you've seen us do this in previous webinars, um, there are a number of things I could do with this. I could SCP this off, which might set off an alert based on going to some IP that is blacklisted. Um, but what I'm gonna do instead is I'm just going to copy this to a bucket that I control as the attacker. that either has right access to the world that I only give temporarily, or if I'm a security conscious hacker, I would create my bucket with a right policy from this account. And then once I perform this upload, I go and remove that policy. So there's no way for you um, as, a, as the company or as a security engineer, whatever you want to call it, to know what data I've stolen. Because my next step would be to clean up my steps, right? I might delete these files. I might go tear down that database. Um, but I'm not going to bother doing that right now since this is just a simulation. So now I'm back out. And if I go to the bucket that I own here, I can see that I've got this data dump that I just generated from a snapshot of a database that I didn't even have to log into. Um, probably was taken during migration, might have been a manual snapshot um, of a secure database that I completely bypassed all security around that database. So uh, pretty scary. Um, how can we stop this kind of thing? How can we protect ourselves? Realize that things that weren't attack surfaces in the data center are attack surfaces now. Um, your backups, you know, you, in the old days, right, we had tape backups of things. Uh, we had offsite backups where you needed physical access. That's easily, much more easily controlled now we're just a few API calls and some overly permissive IM statements away from, from stealing data. Um, ensure all your backups are encrypted. Um, in this case, they were, and I just happen to have permissions to the uh, access keys. Again, this is something that we've already seen in the past and we've taught uh, in past uh, breaches and we've, we've, we've shown in our previous webinars. So I, I didn't want to spend too much time digging into those details, but I wanted to spend the time highlighting this attack and the fact that things that we didn't used to have to think about we now have to think critically about. Control access to your backups. And, and on the heels of that, which I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit, don't keep your backups in the same account as your, as your database, as your networking. Uh, don't allow networking connectivity to your backup account. Keep them separate, keep them physically separate, not just in another region, keep them in a different AWS account altogether. Um, restrict the ability using IAM policies, um, excuse me, <clears throat> IAM policies, maybe an organizational policy if you use uh, something like AWS organizations to restrict the ability to start new databases, especially in your production accounts. There's, there's rarely a situation where you're gonna need to just fire one off, um, you know, uh, just because you need one. That's, that's better done in a dev environment. It should be strictly controlled in production environments. And then kind of more general security uh, best practices in the cloud is maintaining full and continuous visibility into what your infrastructure looks like, what's, what's going on. And you have to continuously validate because things are constantly changing all the time. We, we have planned maintenances, but um, you know, we never, cloud providers make changes, um, you know, developers might, might make changes, um, folks may not follow your CI CD, um, not, may, may go outside of your CI CD and, and make changes in the console themselves. So uh, those kinds of things need to be checked. Uh, I'm sorry, need to be, um, planned for, but also checked. It's a trust but verify situation. And then as we continue to, to hammer on every one of these webinars in the series is, excuse me, is to ruthlessly eliminate unused um, resources. Um, if you have a tool that can let you visualize, that's even better because you can just see it at, at a view. Humans are very, very good at, at seeing things visually versus just looking at a big JSON dump and, and saying, oh, here's a EC2 instance I don't need. Um, I could tell that just in one second from, from looking at that, uh, looking at that visualization. Uh, so um, those are kind of our key take takeaways. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick it back over to Drew for uh, kind of closing thoughts and, and some Q&A. So Drew, back to you. 
Thank you, Wayne. Everybody, please uh, get your questions in using that uh, Q and A uh, tool. Um, first up, are there ways to detect unauthorized databases being created from snapshots? Sorry about that. Uh, the answer is is yes. Um, the the, the, best, the best way is prevention with disallowing the creation of new databases. Um, uh, but of course, like I said, it's trust but verify, right? Um, there are a couple of tools. Uh, there's at least, there's one tool that, that we all love to talk about, um, which is CloudTrail. But as we know, CloudTrail can be um, slow at times. It can take up to 15 minutes and we've seen it take longer for API calls such as restoring um, a database from a snapshot. Uh, there, there are other more instantaneous tools. If you have a tool that scans on a more frequent basis um, and, and sends you alerts, those are ways to do it. Um, there's also CloudWatch events. Um, those fire closer to real-time alerts. Um, so there are ways and there are a handful of tools and, and um, AWS provides a couple and there are others out there. Okay, you, uh, you mentioned unencrypted RDS snapshots. Is there a way to encrypt my old snapshots after they've been taken? Uh, yes. So there is. Um, so it, it partially depends on which database instance. Or I'm sorry, which database engine you're using. Um, I don't recall all of them off the top of my head, but um, there are, there are a handful of them where you can essentially. And I think I can just show this in the console. Give me one second. Let me pull it up. So if I go to RDS, I got my snapshots. Um, you can see a handful of snapshots now. Um, if you select one, and just pick one that's not, you would copy the snapshot. Um, and you would pick your destination reason, give it an ID, and then there's an encryption block right down here. The reason this is grayed out is for Aurora, which is what I was using for this, and that's what the snapshot is. This, this option is not available. For non-Aurora, uh, a, a few engines, you can just flip on encryption and then just hit the copy button and it'll go. For Aurora, what you would need to do, excuse me, what you need to do is stand up a new database instance with encryption turned on for that instance and then take a snapshot of that. Um, and then you can delete your source snapshot, which would, which would be this one. So that'd be the way to do it for, for Aurora instances. And is that uh, one at a time or is, can that be done um, in a batch? And, and I would add a, a question myself is, if you find snapshots that are in the same account as the database, can you move those to a different account? You can share encrypted snapshots with another account. So that would be the way of doing it. Um, and then from there, copy it um, and then delete it from your, so I'm sorry, I'm answering your last question first. Um, you yep. can share encrypted ones. So you still need to go through the exercise of encrypting them. Um, and then you can share from there and perform a copy. Um, and then the other, <laughs> I'm sorry, could you repeat the first question again? Can you do it in a batch? Just kind of, yeah, um, batch. Yeah. So the, yeah, the batching of it, uh, it, in the UI, it's just one at a time. And same with the API. You, would you could just write a script that looks for anything that is encrypted with an answer of no, and then just call, make those API calls to encrypt them. Um, or stand up a new cluster, take a, take a snapshot of that, delete your source. And, and then you've got everything is encrypted at that point. Got it. Okay. Um, what is your the, the best way to kind of conduct an inventory of the snapshots that we have to identify where they are and whether or not they're encrypted? So what I was just showing in the console is one way. Um, if I cancel out of this screen, if you just navigate to the RDS uh, section of the AWS console, you can see all of them here. And this will be paginated if you have hundreds of them. And there's a column to the far right that says encrypted, yes or no. Um, it could also be a scripting exercise where you just write, uh, write an API call to list all your snapshots and then just query for the ones that are, that are not encrypted. Okay, uh, the next is about Fugue. Uh, what I am uh, privileges are required for Fugue to generate that that visualization and our actions that Fugue takes, uh, do they show up in CloudTrail? 
Yes, so I can pull that up. Uh, one second. So to generate the visualization, what we need, <clears throat> excuse me, what Fugue needs is the ability to uh, describe or list your, um, your resources. And I can show you how you have the control to select which resources. So this is my environment, hacking RDS snapshots, and it's tied to a role, to an AWS IAM role that's in your account that has a trust relationship with Fugue's account. And then you select on in this menu um, which which resources that you would like us to scan and, and visualize. Um, not every resource here is uh, shown up in the visualizer, but we're constantly adding things to it over time, um, as driven by requests from from customers and um, and folks trying us out. Um, you know, so you have full control over over what those are. We don't make any modifications um, with the scan on the left side here. Anything that you choose to enforce, this gives us the ability to revert things back. We, we don't create new infrastructure, um, you know, just out of, out of the blue. We look at the previous state of your infrastructure. Say, for example, a security group, if you give us the ability to enforce your security groups. Um, if a security group rule changed, say someone opened up port 22 to the world, um, that's something that you don't want. Um, and that's exactly how some of these exploits, uh, I'm sorry, some of these attacks happen. Um, you could give Fugue enforce permissions and we would revert that back to essentially removing that port 22 open of the world rule. So that's just one example, but we do we can do enforcement on all the resources you see here. And if I hit back, once we have the ability to read everything, um, we can then we then just generate this uh, visualization automatically. It's, it just comes as part of um, part of the product. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Next question, how can I identify orphaned infrastructure in my environment and, and how do I know it when I see it? So it's really going to be, it's, it's, unless, unless it's kind of like, um, I don't remember the phrase, which escapes me now, I apologize, but it's, it's really going to depend on your organization. Um, for example, you may have a, you may have a posture that says, no EC2 instances are, are allowed. And, and in fact, that's uh, something I do have turned on for, for this particular organization. If I look at this EC2 instance, I'm saying no, no EC2 instances. So this is something that I've put in to this organization um, as, a, as a custom rule that, um, that I would know that this is infrastructure I don't want, especially if it's long lived and I know it's orphan. Um, now there are cases for EC2 instances in my, in, for example, in this case, what I would need an EC2 instance for is to talk to this database directly. So I would need to spin up a new AWS EC2 instance inside of one of these public subnets, give it, um, give it permissions through these security groups that can talk to this database just to connect to it directly. Um, and then once I'm finished, if I don't delete it, then I know it's orphaned. Um, but when I'm finished, part of my stance, part of my maintenance script or whatever you wanna call it would be to delete that infrastructure, that infrastructure being the instance. Um, so really, it's going to be on a case by case. Uh, it's hard for someone like uh, like me to look at your environment and say, "Oh, that's orphaned. That's orphaned. That's orphaned." It's going to depend on what what your business definition of orphaned really is. Got it. Yeah, and I would add to um, you know I think something that we've seen here at Fugue is is once once somebody uh, creates a, a visualization, like dynamically generates a visualization from what's running in their environment. Um, a lot of times these problems kind of become visual, uh, visually, visually um, apparent. Um, it's not unusual for, for somebody to run Fugue and then be like, hey, what's that stuff over there? We didn't know that was there. Maybe it's untagged. Um, you know, there, there could be other steps to, to keep it hidden if it's actually, you know, for nefarious purposes. But a lot of times, yeah, as you said, it's just kind of, you know, infrastructure left over inadvertently and it's just kind of sitting out there. Um, obviously, if it's orphaned, it's not being scanned for misconfiguration risk. Um, if it's an EC2 instance, it's not being, you know, patched with the latest updates. So those things kind of degrade into uh, vulnerability risks in and of themselves. Um, looks like we're, uh, we have no more questions. Uh, thanks again, everybody. I uh, do want to invite you to give Fugue a try. It takes just about 10 minutes. 
uh, to, from registering your account to uh, getting a full visualization of your AWS or Azure environment, as well as uh, map that against a number of different compi compliance standards. Um, and Fugue Developer is free for individual engineers. Um, you can grab it at www.fugue.co slash go um, and reach out if you want to chat with us or give us some feedback. We'd love to, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And, uh, you know, send us an email at hello at fugue.co. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time.